and I asked to, to Stevenson to take place, uh, and we have now a, a great sailor. Probably we we move to uh, have a look uh, um, on the experience uh, of uh, Moth. So here, 40 years of experience in, in sailing with, with Moth. Um, we, we can use. Your pictures? Yes, I, I take the picture. I'm, um, James has done 40 years of foiling catamarans. I'm going to try and do 85 years of moth history, um, but only 10 years of foiling. So I'll rush through that. And um, Martin also said he wasn't going to cover control systems and moths, and Andrew McDougall says he's not going to do it tomorrow either. So I'm going to try and fit that in somewhere along the line, even though I didn't prepare it. Um, so I'll get started. Um, that's what I am. Okay. Um, you, you do it by yourself, or I, I yeah, yeah. It? I'll just do that. I'll just hit. Okay. Hit one of these. Yeah. 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 Right. right or down to go. Okay. Um, okay. The moth's been around for over 80 years. Um, nearly as old as the stars that were here last week. Um, the difference is that um, the moths don't look anything like they did 80 years ago. Um, this is what they looked like 80 years ago, and uh, stars still do. Um, they come for the racing, we come for the speed and the racing. Um, they started, the moth started um, both in America and Australia about the same time, 1932. And um, the idea of a, a little simple boat for one person spread around the world. And by the 1960s, there were enough in various classes of the OAAU, previous of ISAF, uh, decided they'd have an international class. And the rules were all amalgamated for the international moth. Um, but that's, sorry about the slides. I've pinched them from all sorts of places and they're not really up to the uh, big screen. But that was, that's um, the American moth class which is still sailing and, and boats probably not dissimilar to what the first American boats were. The first slide I showed you was the first Australian moth. This was the British moth class before the amalgamation. There's the Europe dinghy, which was the French style at the time and became the international one design. Um, now we've got up the hydrofoiling. And it's a bit earlier than most people think because this is Frank Raisin in 1974. Um, that's an Australian gal. All the stuff sticking out of the water and in the water is plywood and sheets of planks of wood. Um, it did start it, it did fall, the hull is clearly out of the water. Uh, that's the best picture that exists. He, um, he's a modest old man. He's only 70s. He still sails international canoes very well, and I've spoken to him quite a lot about it. Um, there's been a lot of innovation in moths over the times. Um, there's a wing mast that was built in the 80s. Um, the class has got some simple rules. That's Andy Patterson in the 90s in England. And he passed was also responsible for the very narrow hulls that we've had now. But before all that, we had the boats, you know, they were this wide, then they got that wide on the water and that wide on the deck. And um, the sails got more complicated. We had pocket luffs in the 1960s. We had square top sails in the 1960s. Um, we've had carbon fibre since 1994 or something like that. Um, the rules have remained roughly the same, 11 foot long hull, one hull only, one sail only, one person only. The sail area has gone from 75 square feet up to 8.25 metres over various rule changes, measured different ways. Um, the beam got added in the 60s because there wasn't a beam limit and then they put the wings on and they got bigger and bigger. So they 2.25 metre, the, roughly the same as A-class, which was the carnet limit in Europe at the time, is what you could drive around borders without needing a carnet. Um, and anyway, we've developed, and there's never been a weight limit. And the reason, that's why we've developed. That is Andy Patterson's boat on its side. It seems to have at least five spoils providing lift. He's got two rudders. That foil there, I'm not sure what it's for, and he still seems to have the original centerboard in it. That's um, pretty weird. I hope the meeting next week and I'll ask about it. Uh, another pioneer 
was Ian Ward, who um, that is in the 60s. That's a kind of very narrow hull with a single centerboard with a hydrofoil on it and a rudder. No control system, no adjustments. Move your weight and hope you don't crash. It crashed a lot. <laughs> um, I saw him sail one. I saw him sail that day a few years later, where he had foils off the wingtips. He had like the the um, uh, Martin showed the picture of the the catamaran with the two windsurfer rigs with the paddles out the front. Uh, he had that sort of system on it. Um, it still was stable in smooth water, and when he hit waves, one of the paddles did something weird, and the boat would throw him off. Uh, he's now. In the, he's one of the pair of people from Sydney who have done the hydrofoils for a laser project and they're selling, they've sold about 50, they told me the other day. Um, this is the first one which most people around the world saw. This is Brett Burble sailing his um, Windrush boat in the World Championships in Perth in 2000. And it's basically just two 45 degree foils. There's nothing on the bottom of that. There's a little bit of structure and it's got a T-foil rudder. He was fast on straight lines and smooth water. It's always smooth water in Perth. And he had trouble turning corners as well. It would throw him off on jibes quite easily. I wasn't there that year. Um, at that time, people were looking at other things. This is another one from Perth. It's, I never met the man, but I've seen his name and I can't remember it, but he's got a, a diamond foil on the bow. <laughs> not unlike Seafly, and two foil rudders. And uh, I'm not sure how successful it was, because it didn't get a chance to get developed, because about that time we had a big controversy in the class about whether people wanted foils or not, and then um, it turned out that enough people wanted it, but they thought, well, too many people considered that they were sailing multi hulls and they should get back to sailing monohulls. The Clark Rules Committee got together and decided that um, if it sat in the water and made more than one hole in the water, it was a multi hull. So if you had foils off the foils and there was air could come through, you could see air underneath it was a multi hull. So the foils had to go for loads of water line. Went back to Wardy's idea, um, one centreboard, foil on the bottom, and uh, the boys in Perth, John Islet, Brett Verbal, Garth Eilert, came up with this thing and uh, that's the basis of what we're using now. Um, and I'll go now to the stability bit that Mark was talking about. The, the flap the wand actuates the flap, it's spring loaded forward so that the, the full position gives the flap up when the boat is high enough for the wand to go forward. When the wand's back, the flap's down. Those two things for the aerofoil. It changes both the camber of the aerofoil and the effective angle of attack of the aerofoil to the cord line, and so it provides more lift with the wand up. And when it comes to the stable position, it's about here, and if you hit waves and get too high, the flap comes up and it brings you down again. The rear foil is um, nominally fixed, but we can twist the tiller um, to adjust the angle of attack. The early ones had a flip on the back, which was less efficient in that um, when you want to bow down, you got more lift and more drag on the rudder. When you want to bow up, you got not less lift, which you know, just pulled the, detracted from the lift that was being driven from the front. Uh, um, my son and Andrew got together and worked out the twist grip thing and all of Andrew's folks since then have had the twist grip. Um, so I don't need to do that. It's a this one, isn't it? Uh, and so that was John Islet's first um, prowler with that system. This one's even got a vertical centreboard, which makes it very early in the piece because they work out fairly soon that you needed to rake the centreboard forward for two reasons. One was that it had to separate centreboard and rudder further, and the other one was that if you rake it forward, air entrainment doesn't go down the leading edge, it comes up, so you don't get um, ventilation. Um, and I think that 
I think that's Rowan heard about the boat, flew to Perth, jumped on the boat, said, I want one. Um, and John Islet was making about three boats a year at that stage. Uh, this was Brett Verbal's last wingtip folder, just before the rule change came effective. Um, he took it to where he got it to go very well. There's Wardy flying a scow with the, um, it's not a wand at the front, it's a ski, as in that other boat that um, Martin showed, but the T-foil rudder, T-foil and the centreboard rudder uh, are all there. Um, that's at a May sailing the one of the mistress boats, which was um, an English boat built when the prowlers were in, and they had prowler type rudders. Um, it was all starting to happen. There was, but mistress and prowler couldn't make many enough boats for the market. There's someone else experimenting. I don't know where that photo came from, or whose it is, or what. It, I assume it's a centerboard, but it doesn't have a flap on it, so it must have been out of control. And then Rowan came along, Rowan got his boat and got sponsored and became a poster boy all over the world. And we've all seen that photo on the teenage boys' bedrooms and that's when the foiling revolution really took off. But um, no one could make enough boats until Andrew McDougall mortgaged his life and created Bright Blade Rider and suddenly a moth went from well, I'll take a couple of steps back that were in my notes that I've skipped. But uh, we went from, before the laser, having 100 boat regattas in cities in, in Australia, in Britain, in the United States. The laser appeared and suddenly everyone didn't want to repair their wooden boat anymore. They went and bought a laser. And um, by the, by the 90, I had 95 moths at Worlds in Australia in um, 1995. By 2001, we had 40 in Japan for the world. And the class was shrinking. People found the boats hard to sail. Um, we had, before, a couple of years before the blade ride, we had our wells in Melbourne. We had 45 boats in Melbourne. And uh, that was with five prowlers, I think. Or the mistress might have been there as well. So the class was shrinking. Um, it never got said, but we felt we were in, in uh, threat of losing international status. And um, Blade Rider basically bailed us out. Well, perhaps first off, Rowan and Ronston getting on posters all over the world in teenage boys selling bedrooms. Um, meanwhile, John Islet continued to make prowlers, a uh, limited number. Prowler and Blade Rider were, Blade Rider was a little better, but Prowler wasn't too bad for a while. Um, people made foils differently. This is the Prowler foil. I think that's a Blade Rider foil, Mac. Maybe not, but it was certainly different. They were more tapered, which we gained the bulb at the front, which was a Tom Spear invention, I believe, um, and uh, became demountable, so that instead of attacking into a box this big just for the hydrofoil, everything fits into the big white boxes that you see out the front. Um, what's that one? It says Blade Rider. That must have been an early rendering. Um, class continued to develop. Bora brought a couple of those to the worlds in Belmont. Um, I threw that one in because I wanted to say that the class just does keep developing. There's Adam May with his version of it that he built. It's been, never been out of England. And there's Andrew with his Mac 2, which um, after he lost control of the company, um, they went to another builder, made some dodgy boats, went broken just at the right time. He came out with a, went back to McDougall and came out with a, um, a different boat, a better boat. And um, I think when we went sailing in Hawaii last year where they limited the fleet to 80, I think there might have been 65 Mac 2s and 15 other boats. Um, we're going to hailing next week. There's 130 entered. Uh, we thought there's probably 100 of them will be Mac 2s. Um, what else have I got? 
This is a gratuitous picture of me and my son. <laughs> um, that was the last boat that I did. There's an um, um, English boat, uh, Ninja. The English people are still developing boats. They've got two factories, two, two companies over there producing exosets and the Ninja people are down doing a rocket version. Um, they're uh, working on it. That's um, Makita foil designed by a couple of guys in my club and sold a few around the world. But the claim is that one of them bolted on the bottom of Boris back to last October won the world. So there's still boats that are going. Um, that looks like a, uh, an exoset. I can't see. The photos aren't good enough for me to see who it actually is. I think they're exoset foils. Um, one of the versions, I think they have different versions for different weather. Um, there's my son sailing the Monstro boat he built in Sydney. That's another boat that's available if people want to buy it. And there's my latest toy, which I'm going to talk to Tom about later. That was the end of my tour. Um, so I don't need that anymore. I think we're on the control. Um, how did I go for time? Probably about right. Um, Do you want the, the last one? No, it doesn't matter anymore. I think I was going to talk about controls. Um, we said the wand, what the wand does. What, the, what it does at what rate it does, we have to vary. There's different settings for different conditions, particularly wave heights. There's three lots of wave heights. There's the wave heights that are about that big that you can just sail straight through and keep going. There's the wave heights that are this big and a long way apart that you can sail up and over like that. You can sail through them okay most of the time. It's challenging. And then somewhere in between you get the wave heights that are just a little bit more from the hull to the foil and about a boat length apart. And they're nearly impossible to sail through, but only the alpha over there can do it and a few others. The boats that sail out all the time. That's why there's 100 strings on those boats over there, and that's why you see lots of pictures of people crashing them because unless you get all the strings in the right place, you probably don't want that one up there, do you, Matt? You want, you want to see one of yours. Oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> um, I built, I sailed moths. In 1963 briefly, in 1975 briefly, in 1990 briefly, and then when my teenage son just said he wanted one in 1998, we started building moths. And since 1998, I've sailed moths pretty well every year. I've built lots of boats. Uh, I've made lots of things that worked and many that didn't work. And like James said, many that broke. Um, so consequently, two years ago, I got sick of carbon dust and I bought one of these from him. Um, they're a wonderful piece of kit. I missed that. Um, but, you know, it never gets out of your blood. You go back and try and make something else again. All right. I started with the stars last week. Did I say it already? Yeah. yeah. Okay. They were here going slow. They still look the way they did 100 years ago. Next week we're going to Hailing Island, going fast. We're going to have just as good a racing at three times, ten times the speed or something. And the moths don't look like they used to be because it's a development class. And um, one day they won't look like they are now. They're going to go faster still. All the one designs that we keep creating just sit there and look obsolete in a few years' time. So that's why I've sailed development boats all my life. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Ah, sorry, you're right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Phil.